you exist. Your feelings, your opinions, your, your callings exist. They matter. And they know what to do within two or three seconds. Every time you don't listen to it, the old story kicks back in and then you go back to the old story. But there's opportunities to go into the new story all the time. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 328. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, we are speaking with Kyle Cease. He's a comedian and transformational speaker with two number one Comedy Central specials to his credit. He's a New York Times bestselling author who shares his unique blend of comedy and personal evolution at his Evolving Out Loud events. Kyle has been a guest speaker at thousands of colleges, summits, and Fortune 500 conferences and leads his own live events. He's made more than 100 various TV and movie appearances, including 10 Things I Hate About You, Not Another Teen Movie, and Jimmy Kimmel Live. As you will hear, Kyle is a really deep thinker with a lot of powerful wisdom to share, and you're going to get so much out of this episode. So here is what Jesse and Kyle talk about today. Money is a mirror of your connection to yourself, why it's important to invest money in yourself, how to bring awareness to your why, what it's like to sit in silence, creating boundaries with social media, and how physical things take up space in your mental world. So much great stuff. Really excited for you to hear this. Here we go with Kyle Cease. Hello, Kyle. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to chat with you today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. To start off, I want to go back to the beginning of your comedy career. I know you started performing all the way back at age 12. So I'm just curious, where were you performing at that time? You know, at 12 was more like kind of assemblies and different things at school, you know, but at the same time, like there was a place called Linda's Funny Farm that was under like an Alfie's Pizza that had a small teeny comedy venue and different open mics and things like that. You know, there was also a club called Giggles that I was working definitely in a lot of my teen years. It was amazing. Were you always the funny kid growing up? When did you first realize that you had a knack for comedy? Honestly, with comedy, it was so a part of me that it wasn't even like I realized there was something unique or had the ability to have awareness of it. Like, in other words, I would tell jokes and just do that. And then people would say stuff like, one day we'll see you on TV or one day you'll be famous. And I was always offended because I was like, I am now. Like, I'm like, I'm in front of the school. (laughs) I do the assemblies. And I didn't have any part of me that saw, you know, later as better than now. So kind of in the moment, I was just really enjoying creating at that level and being funny. But I definitely look back now and realize that I was able to use comedy to get love, to avoid, you know, pain, to, you know, be in this place that you can make jokes and people will talk to you and look at you. And it's also a great way to bond. You know, laughing is an amazing thing. And we're all cry laughing. We're all staring at each other while we're doing it and very in the moment, you know. In the early days, did you find yourself really comfortable up on stage in front of people? Yeah, I think I actually learned stage fright later. I learned how to be a comedian before I learned how to be a person. And I was on stage at such a young age that it was just normal to me to do it. And I just know that when I was on stage, when I was a kid, I had everyone's attention. People were aimed at me. It was awesome. Then at one point started going through different things where that comedy built into a huge comedy career that was amazing and successful. And I got to do movies and late night shows and Comedy Central and stuff. But at the height of it, at one point, I really remember going through a little bit of stage fright, like for the first time at like 27 years old, after having done it for 13 to 15 years at that point. And that stage fright wasn't just like, oh, I'm a little nervous on stage. It was everything that I've ever been is about to die. And back then, that means I'm going to die. Like, if I can't do comedy, I'm nothing. I really believe we all kind of think that we are a thing. Like, I am this relationship. I am this amount of money. I am this Porsche. I am where I live. And then if that thing goes away, we often trick ourselves into thinking that we will be nothing. And that's where the beginning of the transformational parts of my journey started. What do you think it was that caused that shift in how you're performing? Well, there have been several different shifts in my life, many, many different huge shifts in my life. And and they all start with a falling apart. And the falling apart is the illusion of something that you think you need to be happy is about to fall off. 
And I go through stages of this all the time. I still do, but it's like deeper stuff. It's more stuff that's internal, you know? And for me, like a huge shift was when I moved out of motivation. I mean, I'm not anti-motivation, but motivation isn't what I do. And to me, motivation is when something happens, I'll be happy. And we all have this thing in us that says, when I get the job, when I get the money, when I get the person in my life, when I let go of the person in my life, when I let go of the job, whatever, I'll be happy. And I've gotten to experience a lot of the things that I thought I really wanted. And instead, I learned life isn't about when something happens, I'll be happy. It's when I'm happy, things will happen. And by happy, I mean, okay with every part of myself, right? Like, okay with this moment. So for me, at one point, I went through kind of a shift where I let go of motivation and just allowed myself to let go of everything that was in the way of the ultimate version of myself. And that what we're here to do, we're like helium balloons that are always trying to go up, but our string is just caught on something stupid, like what's going on on the news or what you know someone thinks about you or whatever. And our job much more in my eyes is to cut the string. And when you do, you just accidentally will move forward because it's just our normal right to move forward and release the inner baggage that we hold on to. Can we get into some of the specifics during that time when you're, you know, fearing going up in front of people and this is your career, how you're making money and you really can't step back and take a break because again, this is your career. So what do you do to keep moving forward and pull yourself out of that? And I will get into specifics, but I'll say one thing that I don't recommend for people is pulling themselves out of it. <laughs> like I had a client recently and I'll, I'll tell you some specifics in a second, but I had a client recently who was like, had three different concussions in the last year. And she said, yeah, you know, life knocks me down and I get back up. And then she goes, and then life knocked me down again three months later and I got back up again and made it happen. And then life knocked me down a third time and I said, stay down. Why do we keep getting up? Like life wants us to be down for a minute to relax because sometimes motivation is the small past story is going to get up. And sometimes our highest calling is totally against everything we think that we're supposed to do. So when I was at a major Comedy Central career. And, you know, I had two Comedy Central specials and all this stuff. For me, at one point, I just really remember feeling more of a desire to show other people that they have these abilities. I had so many people say to me, I wish I could do stand up comedy. And I had this thought of like, what if a lot more people could? Not that the goal is for everyone to do stand up, but what if we all just believe we're not that great and we are? Like, what if when I was a kid, I told a joke to my dad and he laughed, so he drove me to a comedy club. But what if he wanted me to be a lawyer or said, you're not funny? Then, you know what I mean? I wouldn't have necessarily known what I am and done this. And I think that we have a lot of conditioning that says that you are talented or you're not. So I started getting excited to show people that they have this. Because I said, if you've ever told a joke once or ever were funny once and it got a laugh, that means you have it. And the factor was that you weren't trying, that it's just your second nature to do that. So for me, I noticed that at the height of my comedy career, I wanted to show other people. And this started a, a situation where comics that I, I had been friends with or whatever said, oh, Kyle went off the deep end. Kyle's crazy. Kyle's become a cult leader and all these different things. And I was just like, no, I just kind of feel these amazing, positive things. And I really want to show other people this. And at one point, it got so big where comics were all talking about and saying this, that I had to go to a new place in my life where I had to release control. I had to release control of what people thought about me. I had to release control of what they might say. And it wasn't like from a denial place. It was like there was a visceral thing in my body that was grabbing onto what everyone might say. But it was really me scared to lose my mom's approval, you know, through those people. So these comics would start to say different things. And I had to let go and, and literally be in a hotel for a week and cry it out. And at one point, I remember my mind going through this stage for days of wanting to prove to them and, and wanting to kind of motivate my way back to a number one special to prove that I'm legit. At one point, I just on day four of sitting in a hotel, saw my mind saying like, what if I do this? What if I do this? And I realized I'm sitting here saving my life when nothing's wrong. Like, I'm in a hotel room and for four days, like getting motivation in response to my fear of what they say. On that day, I noticed my mind was this chaotic thing that it was saving its life, but it wasn't actually in danger. The truth was I was just a dude sitting on a bed 
And that was the beginning of a major shift in my life because like all my thoughts fell apart, like all my identities and stories and everything I thought I was and trying to get somewhere else collapsed. For somebody who's in a place, I'm sure all of us have this to some extent where we are worrying about what other people are saying. What's the process to get started and and to do that work? The first thing to do is be okay with how you feel right now. Like no matter what it is, this is because the only thing we have is this moment. And this moment is it. And most people are in the past and future going, how do I, what do I? And that's a response to our fear of looking at ourselves fully in this moment, being with yourself, feeling your entire body. Like it's weird. We live in a society that just you could have four or five hours go by. And if you're not constantly in a panic of going, what do I do next? What's the next step of my life? You think that you're nothing. And we aren't designed to be constantly in the future like that. We're designed to be here. We're designed to be present. We're designed to be, okay, so a way to do that is to actually say what you're feeling right now without a reason. Like to just say, I feel scared. Not I feel scared that they won't like me. Not I feel blah, blah, blah. Just I feel unloved. I feel scared. And be with that for a minute. In fact, if you say, I feel whatever that dark feeling is, and then follow it with, and I love that, you'll be shocked at how quickly it moves to tears. I feel stuck. I feel lost. I feel scared. And I love that. That's an empowering thing because you're actually bringing love to places in you that you've been scared to go into. Then you start to actually connect to your body fully. And from this place, you can make bigger decisions. And getting to the point of tears and that emotional state and release, that is the goal at that point? Often crying happens after you've been holding on to something, right? I'm holding on, holding on, holding on. And then I cry it out, almost like throwing up or something like that. Like there's this release, right? After you cry something out, you're on the other side of something. And one of the things we trick ourselves into doing is thinking we're the feelings that are trying to leave. It'd be like going to the bathroom and thinking you're the stuff that's about to leave your body, but you're the space that it's leaving from, right? You're not the stuff. And so old stories, old patterns are trying to leave us all the time. But we're so busy grabbing onto things that the patterns want, but not what we want, that they keep the patterns alive. So for instance, you might have a pattern where when you were a kid, you didn't feel you could get your parents approval. So you might actually look to date someone who feels similar to that, someone who doesn't approve of you. So you can feel your ego feeling like it can overcome that. So a pattern is now dating this person versus your soul. And we often make decisions like career and how do I make money and the right relationship out of a pattern that you picked up versus the truth of what you are. And when you actually are a space for the pattern, but you don't cater to the pattern, it can be cried out and you actually access a higher level of what you are. Like, for instance, money. Fear is something that wants money a lot more than our heart. Like, I get that we want money. We all need money for rent. We need those things. There's no question. But the only reason we are chasing it so addictively is we don't understand that you're the source of every dollar you've ever brought in. So you should get more excited about you than money. Because you are that source. And if you actually focus on that and expand that, you actually remove this egoic part of you that thinks it's not enough and create a space to receive that's much bigger. And that's the real work. And one of the reasons we have a hard time transforming things is we can't receive on the level that we're actually worthy of. Like if you go into a relationship and you find someone who can love you more than on a higher level than you can love yourself, that might be horrifying to you. So you might sabotage it and go, who loves me at the level that I usually love myself, which is pretty crappy. If you think of who you are as someone who makes $20,000 a year and someone offers you a million dollars, that could be death to the story of who you are. So you might sabotage it and not allow it to show up. So what we actually are is this moment and this moment can receive and create anything. But the patterns think I'm the past story, which doesn't exist. And I'm not worthy of this giant, bigger, more amazing thing. Yeah, I totally get that. And this reminds me of something that you talk about, how money is actually a mirror of a relationship to ourself. Well, let's take it this way. If you and I were to go for a walk in the woods, and then I rounded a corner and you didn't see where I went, and I found an entire waterfall just falling, and I grabbed a cup of water and then came back from the waterfall, and you didn't see the waterfall, and I just said to you, oh my God, look, a cup of water. You'd be like, oh, wow, cool. But you'd also be like, well, what if we run out of it? Or is there enough water there for me to pay rent next week? I'm not showing you the most important factor, and that's the waterfall. And so 
when we learn to actually be connected to the space, we learn to connect to the source of our infinite ideas, our million dollar ideas, our worthiness, our confidence. So we are often chasing money. Here's another example like that. Like think about the thoughts that we unconsciously have about money. Like just think of when you look at money and think, God, why can't it be more? Or you might have a belief from your family dynamic that says money's the root of all evil. Or you might be like, it doesn't grow on trees. It's never enough. Money doesn't grow on trees means I don't believe that I can receive this, right? So now picture that you're money and you're on a date with you and you're just hearing you're never enough, right? You're, you're totally, you know, the root of all evil. If you were money, you'd be like, well, this place isn't safe for me to come to. It can't receive me. It can't receive something awesome. So it's going to leave. If you were actually on a date with a person who said you're never enough, you should be more, you'd leave the date, right? So that's the same thing, right? So money is a mirror of your connection to yourself. Because if you're on a date with someone who loved themselves, who was connected to the source of themselves, they would feel safe. They would feel awesome. And you'd want to be hanging with them. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Kyle to give a shout out to our show partner, ButcherBox. Jesse and I have had a long journey to include meat into our diet. We were vegetarian, even vegan for a long time. So when we made the decision to bring meat back into our diet, quality was at the forefront. There was not a chance we were going to compromise on that. We knew we wouldn't settle for anything less. And not only does quality meat taste better, but it's better for the animals, better for the environment. And we started this process slowly. We actually started with fish, then we consumed chicken, then we went to red meat. And it was a process, but we feel better for it. And we know that we're making a good decision. And that's why we're so happy to have companies like ButcherBox available, people who are committed to sourcing high quality meat and delivering it right to your door, which makes it really easy and really convenient. They have options like grass fed and grass finished beef, free range chicken, heritage pork, wild caught salmon, and nitrate and sugar free bacon. This is amazing, and if you are committed to health like us, you know how hard it can be to even find this quality meat even at your health food store. So make the leap and go ahead with ButcherBox. All their meat is antibiotic-free, and there's no added hormones, and it's super easy, affordable, and convenient, and you're going to be happy to be supporting Humanely Raised Meat. And as a listener of our show, you can go and sign up with ButcherBox today and get two pounds of ground beef, two packs of bacon absolutely free, plus you get $20 off your first box. All this by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash butcherbox. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash butcherbox. Or you can use the code ultimatehealth at checkout. Either way, you're going to get an incredible deal. And now a shout out from other show partner, Sun Warrior. For plant-based peeps, if you're looking for a product to help your body build collagen in a natural way, you're going to want to get your hands on Sun Warrior's Collagen Building Protein Peptides. This is an incredible product that is totally keto-friendly, it's plant-based, it's got hyaluronic acid and biotin, it's got vitamin C, no synthetic vitamins, and it tastes amazing. It comes in vanilla, it comes in chocolate, it comes in natural And it is a great way to provide the components for your body to build its own collagen. So go ahead and get this. You're going to benefit from it because your skin's going to glow and your hair and your nails are going to grow and you're just going to love the way that it feels in your body. And as the listener of our show, you get 20% off all your Sun Warrior purchases by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. On top of that, if you spend $50 or more, you get free shipping. Go and give the collagen building protein peptides a try today. I know saying it can be a mouthful, but you're going to love this product. And now back to our chat with Kyle. This ties into a story you give in your book with the three Helens, where you have Helen A, Helen B, and Helen C. And to quickly paraphrase this, if all three Helens were given a million dollars, You talk about how Helen A decided to buy some different things, maybe a new car, a new home. Helen B decided to be a little bit more cautious and put some money into savings and just maybe buy a couple little things that she needed. And then there's Helen C that took that money and invested it in herself, which again ties into money being a mirror of our relationship to ourselves. So she's actually investing in herself as a person. Talk about why Helen C is the way to go. 
Yeah, you want something that changes you. We've heard the, you know, thing about put money in your 401k or invest in assets and not liabilities. That's good stuff. And that's the B method, I feel like when you can get to a state where your money makes money for you. That's awesome. But what I'm excited about is that you can change. A person can transform into something different. So when you invest C money, you're doing something that'll change you. For instance, renting a cabin for a month and listening to silence, right? No phone. That's C money because you're going to come out of that with different reality. You're going to cry out old patterns. You're going to actually change different ways that you see things and you're going to make different decisions. That money right there will pay for itself times millions because you're so aware of what you are. C money is also something that invests in your creativity. So to give you an example, I used to rent this place called the Alex Theater and it was awesome. And I would rent these shows, you know, and rent the theater and do shows there. And we'd have 1,400 people each time. I'd also put the money in a camera crew and editors and a team. And everyone was like, what are you doing? That's so expensive. This together would be like $50,000, $60,000. Right. But what would I have to become to match this giant 1,400 seat theater that I'm doing? And not only that, but like, how confident did I become as I do these events one after another? And then we made products out of it. And it's paid for itself over and over and over and over again. And the only reason we're scared to invest money there is because you can measure what you will lose, and you can't see what you'll gain. And so at one point, while I was doing those theaters, I decided to rent the Dolby Theater, which is where they do the Oscars. It's 3,400 seats. And I remember calling them and finding out how much it was. And it was really expensive. It was way in the six figures. And I realized if I rent that, it will be massive expensive, but also it will help me to access the bigger part of me that can make even more and bring in more. So I told them yes, and we rented it. And the next day, I felt so powerful because I'm someone who can even rent the theater that the Oscars are at. And I went on stage at the Alex Theater, and I announced to them that I was doing the Dolby Theater. And the craziest thing was, I'm trying to remember the exact number of what happened, so I don't get this wrong, but I remember it was about 1,250 people were in the room the time I mentioned that event at the Dolby Theater. And to the 1,250 people, we sold 1,300 tickets right there. My confidence and my energetic state was so powerful that they joined that energy and we paid for the theater the day after I bought it. And all the rest of the ticket sales that came in were just a profit. And not only that, but then it became an amazing video series. You can see Love Rising at the Dolby Theater. It's an insane two-day event and it's $20. We've sold it to thousands and thousands and thousands of people and they get thousands of dollars worth of change for 20 bucks. When was this and how did the big event go? The big event was magic. There's a trailer. If you type in Kyle Cease Love Rising on YouTube, you can see it. It's crazy. It's this huge trailer. It's 3,400 people, giant theater. And you can see the event online on my website. You can see it on our Absolutely Everything Pass. It's amazing. It was crazy. But it also not only changed the money dynamic, it changed who I am. I got acclimated to the idea that I'm someone who does 3,400 seats. And this is a normal feeling now. So you can actually change and reacclimate your body when you invest in C money. But it also paid for itself way better than if I put it into some 401k that got back whatever 5% each year. It it paid back 5,000. It actually probably has paid back measurably 5,000% so far. Not to mention in the confidence that I created, how much less addictions that I needed to spend the money on. Because I feel good and because I'm in my alignment, I'm not buying blood pressure medication. I'm not buying Pepsi and addictive pattern things. I'm buying only almost C-money things. For me, a personal trainer is C-money. For me, a nutritionist is C-money. For me, delegating anything that isn't my highest version of me is C-money. Like I can't do this call and, and the other calls if I'm also doing the accounting. So having like the money go to people doing the things that aren't my highest calling is C-money too. For somebody who this whole perspective is totally new, they're, you know, holding on tight to each dollar bill. How do they begin to loosen up and begin to invest in themselves? Great question. Well, the first thing we have to do is bring in awareness, because the only reason we hold on to something is awareness. We aren't aware of the entire story. So if you understood the same part of you that's holding your money is holding million dollar ideas you might be different about it. Like the same part of us that's holding our money is it's a statement that says I'm the apple and not the apple tree. 
I'm the product that I created versus the creator of the product. And this is a really big deal to move into a state of what you actually are. And only do that if it calls to you. Don't do it because someone else said do it or I'm saying do it. Only do what calls to you. But we're here to move to a state of flow. We're here to move into the apple tree. An apple tree just gives its apples. It just makes them and gives them, makes them and gives them. And it should be doing that for people who also move like apple trees, meaning like, don't just give it to takers. You want to be collaborating with other apple trees, not other people that take apples. It's a different type of flow where you move into the infinite creative being that you are. It's past the level of what do I get? Because no apple tree has ever been like, well, what will I get for these apples? Do other people like apples? Maybe I'm more of a pear tree. You know what I mean? Like no one else does that. No tree does that. And we got to move more like nature moves versus society. Society is out of its mind. Do you think that nature was like, I want you all to focus on Donald Trump's impeachment, be caught on Facebook all day, get worried about what they're saying politically here and there, get you know stuck on Netflix and just do a bunch of addictions. I don't think nature wanted that for us. I think nature saw us as these infinite, creative, powerful beings that could change the consciousness of the planet. And that's our purpose. And there's a reason why when we do a bunch of addictions, we get sicker and tired and more stressed because we're hoarding our gift and we're hoarding our money and we're hoarding our whatever. And what do you think is at the core of pulling people away from their purpose? You can't sell people things that they don't need unless you, first of all, make them think they're not enough. If the news constantly scares the crap out of you, then they can sell you Prozac on the commercial break or let you think that Pepsi and Coke will make you be something. There's an amazing manipulative pattern. And the reason they do that over there is because they aren't aware of what they are. And there's a lot of people that go, when I have billions and billions of dollars, I'll be happy. And then we hear usually often they get depressed or are suicidal or whatever, because it's not the answer to anything. You're the source of this. Get excited about you more than the money. And Kyle, coming back to your story, I'm curious, when did you first come in contact with personal development? Was this something that your parents put out in front of you? Or was it a Tony Robbins audio book? Or... Yeah, there was a stage that was anxiety and stage fright. And the first thing I did was, you know, basically stress. And I had a Comedy Central thing coming. And I thought I had this created stage fright where I thought, I wonder if you think about it enough, if you could make yourself faint. And I got worried that I'd make myself faint. And the bigger picture was then that would ruin my career and I'd be nothing. So I did listen to a Tony Robbins first thing. And that moved me to motivation that moved me out of the victim into an achiever mode. So I started really picturing and focusing on the outcome of having a number one special. It was the most played special of 2006. In 2009, I got very motivated and went through more Tony Robbins type feelings of like, how can I have the number one special again? And then I won Comedy Central stand up showdown best comedian of 2009. It was great. And then the fall apart kind of opened up more of an Eckhart Tolle esque, you know, Wayne Dyer type place, Byron Katie type energy. And so I let myself fall apart, went through these things and discovered that if you let yourself fall apart, life still has stuff for you that's way bigger. You haven't just been into the mindset and personal development. I know at one point in 2011, actually, you decided to try on a raw vegan diet. And this was a 90 day experiment. And you announced publicly, if you break this diet, you're going to give away $10,000. So explain, first of all, where you heard about this diet. It's funny, because it goes back to that nature concept thing. But there's a part of me that just wonders, it just plays with the idea, are we supposed to be eating what we're eating? I mean, humans get sicker than every other species. Humans are always sick. The only ones that get really sick like that are domesticated animals that are eating stuff that humans made. So like the question for me started being like, are we supposed to be eating processed cheese and even meat and bread? And there's a lot of people that debate on it. And there's no part of me now saying an answer to that. But I noticed also that there was a pattern in me that associates I get love by eating burritos, you know, with my mom when I was a kid, I get love and connection when I go to a restaurant with my friends. So I thought what would happen if I only ate organic raw vegan food, meaning like literally the food is just made out of vegetables and beans and and stuff and not cooked and nuts and things like that. And I thought what would happen would be that I'd get really healthy, but I became super healthy, but also went through the patterning of letting go of everything that I was. And that was the start of letting go of not only that, but letting go of Facebook more, letting go of dating for a while. I'm not now anti those things, 
but my body was like aware somehow that there was a pattern that was going on when I was doing it. So I then in the height of that, let go of stand up comedy. I remember about 45 days in thinking I no longer want to do comedy clubs on the road. And in a documentary into a camera, I looked in the camera and I said, I'm officially done doing comedy clubs on the road. And a week later, I had this big space open up where I would have been on the road, but this space opened up and the space said, what if you combine comedy and transformation? And I remember my ego going, well, the way you want to do it, I don't think anyone's ever done it. My soul was like, yeah, no one's ever done it. Like, what if you combine comedy and transformation this specific way? And so I had my friend come over and he brought the camera. He filmed me making a video for 500 different college bookers of colleges that I had performed it as a stand-up. And in the video, I said their name and I said, I want to come do the lecture circuit. You know, people were saying to me, what are you doing? Why are you making these videos and what the hell? Well, then a hundred of those colleges within, you know, a little bit of time, like said yes to that at a much higher price and a lot more money came in. And all of a sudden I let go of one thing. And here I was a comic where I was one of thousands of comics. I was headlining comedy clubs for four or 5,000 for a week. And all of a sudden now I'm the only one in my field the way I want to do it, doing exactly what I do, flying out, saying exactly what I want to say, owning who I am. And it pays twice as much for one night versus like me doing a week long and doing radio and everything else, you know? So it was like crazy. I like birthed this new me that was higher and better. And was it scary for you at the time when you you sat down and made those videos and sent them out? You were giving up the security of your previous life and comedy. How did that feel? Here's where I'm going to sound crazy, but I was already on a different dimension where I was more excited about what was birthing than scared of what I was letting go of. So there's a cliche that it's choosing to make the decision where all the fear is, right? So like I was playing with what if I went raw vegan for 90 days? I was playing with that idea dancing back and forth and my mind could measure what I would lose. It couldn't see what I would gain. My mind could see, well, yeah, but what about at Thanksgiving? And what about when they're eating this? And what about, I can see what I'll lose. I can't see what I'll gain though. And when I finally said, okay, I'm officially doing raw vegan for 90 days. And then to make sure I actually did it, I I said, I'll give away 10 grand if I eat anything cooked or animal based. I did it. And when I got to like day two, I was like, holy crap, how good will this get? And it turned out to be not only about health, it turned out to be the shift of my career. It turned out to be by the end of it, I could run 10 miles without even breaking a sweat. It turned out to be I'm 150 pounds when I'd always been about 220. It turned out to be like the craziest adventure ever and understanding the biggest teaching of all, which was for me, when you let go of something, you're only stressed because your mind can measure what you'll lose and it can't see what you'll gain. I did it with a dear friend of mine named Diego who we were in this kind of, you know, transformational work together. And we did find that when we let go of something, our experience was the better thing showed up minutes afterwards. It was really trippy. That's the case. I mean, we understand that in relationships, you can't get the ultimate relationship while you're dating the wrong relationship. You can't get the ultimate career while you're, you know, in the wrong career. You're not able to receive it. You're on a different channel. You're on a different vibrational state. So it was getting more exciting. The underlying inertia and momentum was more excited than scared at that point. Then at one point it was like, okay, the career's gone, the da da da, the stand up's gone. And then I just was following it all the time. I even had this happen. I had a huge agency that was taking 10% of the college gigs that I was getting, but they weren't getting me the college gigs. They didn't feel in that alignment. So I was giving them 10% for no reason. So my body just goes, yeah, you should let go of them. And usually when you have that, my mind came up with, but I should keep them because they get me for auditions for movies and comes up with reasons to keep something. If I'm justifying why I'm keeping something, I have to let go of it because everything that's truly in your heart, you would never justify. So I have to let go of it. And so I decided to drop this agency, which was crazy. And every comic I knew was like, are you out of your mind? You're dropping that agency? I said, yeah. And then I did. And then like two weeks later, I find out Jim Carrey and Eckhart Tolle have created an event together called Gate. And they asked me to speak at it. Now, that's the most me gig I've ever heard. Jim Carrey and Eckhart Tolle combined and are doing an event together. And I did this talk there. I had all this confidence. I was not even the guy who needed the agency. It was amazing. And then all these producers and agents and stuff were starting to offer me roles in movies right there. 
And I was thinking it's funny because before I was worried about losing the auditions for movies and now I'm just being offered parts and I let go of the thing I thought I needed to get the thing. So when you let go of something, you're going to be shocked at how much your mind can measure what you'll lose and it can't see what you'll gain and how much you'll gain is so much bigger than everything you're ever worried about losing. You talked about going with the feeling in your body versus what is happening in your mind. Can you go deeper into that and talk about what that feeling's like and how we go about doing that? Yeah. I really believe that your body knows within two seconds every decision. It really does. Like, I don't want to even put this in people's face, but it knows if you're in the wrong relationship. It knows. It knows if you're in the wrong career or the right career. It knows. And we've trained ourselves to ignore it. It knows within two seconds. It gives you callings within two seconds. It goes, what if we went to Italy right now? You know, those little moments. What if we start a band or leave the company? It's like in two seconds, it knows. But we ignore it after that. We go into our head and our head comes up with stupid reasons why we shouldn't follow it. And that's our pattern that's making the decision, not you. Your pattern is coming up with why you shouldn't follow it. Your old story is scared to die. Your old story is scared to die, but that's not you. And your pain is you think you're the old story versus the new. And so our job is to follow the feeling in my eyes. I've never followed the feeling and not had myself access more magic and more craziness. So that's what I offer people is that like your body knows within two seconds. When we go to that state of like making a pros and cons list about like what we want in a car, for instance, oh, let's have the pros and cons list. Well, it has this and da, 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 da. You're making a decision from your head. You don't even know if you like the car. It's just a level of what you should do. So you're just a collection of a society versus someone that exists here. You exist. Your feelings, your opinions, your, your callings exist. They matter. And they know what to do within two or three seconds. Every time you don't listen to it, the old story kicks back in and then you go back to the old story. But there's opportunities to go into the new story all the time. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Kyle to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. Organifi has such an incredible lineup of products, and I'm actually enjoying one of them right now, and that is the red juice powder. So I have this mixed with some Berkey water. I'm sipping on it while we do our recordings, and this stuff just tastes incredible, loaded with nutrition, and it kind of is reminiscent to me by smell and taste of Kool-Aid as a kid. And obviously, this product is all pure ingredients, organic, and I know you're going to love it. It's like the healthiest juice you can have because it's actually got real fruit in there. It's got raspberries, strawberries, cranberries. I can actually smell it from here. It smells so good. And you got the added benefit of adaptogens. So if you haven't tried the red juice powder yet, we highly recommend it. I've been telling Jesse to drink more of it because I know how much he enjoys it. So this is something that I know is going to be part of his daily routine now. Most definitely. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off the whole Organifi lineup by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Another great thing about the red juice powder is it's dry. It's in a nice small container so you can bring it with you on the go and make red juice wherever you're at. Again, this stuff's incredible. I know you're going to love it. Give it a try today. Now I'm going to share an incredible review coming from JJDBSN from the USA. We got five stars and it's titled Life Changing Podcast. This podcast is absolutely amazing. Jesse and Marnie, you have completely changed my life with this podcast. 10 months ago, I was 100 pounds overweight with depression and anxiety. Just got diagnosed with melanoma cancer. At that point, I had no hope in life. One day, I just started searching health podcasts, and I stumbled upon your podcast. And since then, I never looked back. I have lost weight, overcome my depression and anxiety, and beat cancer. All this from this podcast. I've learned so many tips and awesome things that have helped me with my health journey. I truly can't thank you enough. God bless. Wow. What an amazing review, amazing testimonial, and we are just so happy to hear the transformation you have made in your health. Thank you so much for sharing this. These are the kinds of things that light us up and keep us doing what we're doing. What an incredible review. First of all, I want to say congrats on your health transformation. That's amazing. And secondly, thank you for taking the time to leave the kind words. It really makes our day. And if you haven't left us a review yet, 
All you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash review. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash review. And if you go to that URL, we've created a couple of amazing infographics and it takes you step-by-step through the process of leaving a review. It won't take you long and it means the world to us. Thank you ahead of time. And now back to our chat with Kyle. Kyle, a couple of times during the interview, you've talked about sitting in silence, and I know this is a big part of your work. I want to get into meditation as well and talk about if there's a difference there, but let's start out by talking about that practice. Again, you talked about it when you were talking about being in the hotel room earlier in the interview for a few days, and you also mentioned going to a cabin and being silent. So I don't think this is something that people have really heard a lot about or the benefit. So is this different than meditation? Yes and no. I still call it meditation, but there's aspects to meditation that aren't what I do necessarily. Like when they say, okay, now focus on this. And if your mind goes on a tangent, bring it back. Or, you know, at Vipassana meditation, they say, you know, focus on this area under your nose and keep your focus there. And to me, that's a training of the mind, which is fine for some people. And guided meditations are fine for some people if that's nice. But what I find is that life wants to just do surgery on your old story and remove it. And if you listen long enough, it will just start going in and taking the old you out of your body. It will actually remove it. And the patterns that we have need fuel, right? I get love for watching movies when I was a kid. Okay, so now you want to keep Netflix so that you can feel like you're still with your parents, right? So that's a pattern getting fuel. But I find that if you're just chilling and allowing yourself to be silent with your eyes closed or open, but especially I find closed, you will discover that you will start to hear deeper inner voices in you. And what I call is like the breakup single soulmate. In other words, the first 30 minutes of every meditation for me, every listening is like a breakup. It's like everything I was is trying to fall apart. Then after 30 minutes, it's like I'm single. I just broke up. So I'm single. Here I am with this part of my mind where the egoic pattern isn't there as much. So I'm just here. And then I find 45 minutes in, my soulmate shows up. In other words, the next million dollar idea, the next book deal, the next whatever stage, the next you shows up. And it does because you're now here in this moment and you're in a state to receive it on a much bigger plane. So the practice is just being in silence, most likely closing our eyes and just sitting through whatever comes up. Yes, completely. And it sounds like that's so simple and crazy and it should be more complicated. And that's the ego talking there. Because at one point I said, I'm going to go 100 days listening to silence for two hours a day. And then I'll make a video out of it. And it was like the best thing I ever did. Why? What did you get out of it? First of all, you get way more time, which sounds ironic. You're like, how do you get more time if you listen to silence for two hours? Well, you wake up and you go, I got to call this person. I got to call this person. I got to do all this stuff. And then you listen to silence for a while and you realize I don't have to call those people. And the reason was because some of the people I was going to call was out of a fear and attachment. Like I'm calling them because I don't want them to be upset with me. I'm calling them to keep this thing that doesn't align with my soul because I'm scared to lose something. And you shift out of that and you move to a state of what you want to do, not what you should do what you learned you should do based on societal patterns. We want to be in what we want to do. What's life like if you do what calls to your soul and expands you versus you constantly living in a state of spinning these plates and doing what you think you're supposed to do based on what? Who says what you're supposed to do based on what? Where did that come from? Your parents, the news, what, who said you should be doing anything and replacing that with what you want? What calls to me? What expands my heart? What would make me better? And for me, listening to two hours of silence does that. You learn all kinds of stuff about yourself, especially if you do it multiple days in a row, because it starts to add on to itself, like going to the gym. It's magic. I think the argument you'd probably get from a lot of people is two hours a day. That's time I could be spending with my kids or my partner or doing a yoga class. The 21st century, there's just so much to do and we're so busy. How do we begin to value that time of silence? Well, first of all, you're probably hanging out with your kids less than if you did this, first of all, because most of us think on this level, like you just talked about, that what we are is what we do. So we're just this giant collection of people that are not doing what our soul wants. And our soul might want to hang with our kids more, right? And we can't hear it. We're just kind of like 
putting priority in Netflix and Facebook and stuff, but like, what would the two hours do? And what would you hear that you want? And what would you suddenly not do? I know people that quit jobs after this and then like actually are in a space to receive money on an easier way and become more intuitive and and help people in a different way. No part of me is saying anyone has to. I'm just saying I know from experience the benefits that happened for me. And I'm in no way trying to get anyone else to do it. But I got to say, oh, it's like it did surgery on me. And I almost was about to be a pattern doing things. Do you know what I mean? Like I almost was like this me that thinks I should hang with my kids versus a calling that wants to. A me that can actually be there for people that isn't triggered by everything. That's another thing. You're not triggered by people. So things happen more effectively, much faster. People can only trigger the part that you don't see in yourself. So if you see yourself each morning, no one triggers you or they do a lot less. That's a gift right there. Okay. And Kyle, you've touched on Facebook a couple times. And I noticed preparing for our chat, going to your Instagram profile, it's actually your team that manages that. So talk about your evolution with social media over the years and how you've brought it to where you're at today. So my team runs the Instagram and my Facebook. My Facebook probably has, I don't know now, I haven't looked at it for months, but it had, when I last was looking, 450,000 or something like that, 400,000 followers, something like that. I don't care, by the way, how many I have. It has nothing to do with what I am. And so one of the things I noticed was that when I was looking at Facebook and kind of in an addictive V pattern, like I've never gone on Instagram in my life. And when I look at those things, I don't know, I feel my vibration lowers, I feel like it's a lot of just opinions and arguments down threads. And I can't hear what my inner guidance says just by staring at that stuff. So I am in a place where what I find is that my connection to myself is worth way more than like managing the audience. So their questions are all answered by the team and stuff. And really important questions still get to me. But it gives me a boundary, it gives me a spiritual boundary a connection boundary where my inner peace is more important to me. I'm just not wanting to be caught in the drama of things. Well, and this ties back into what we were just talking about. Where do we get that two hours, in your case, to be silent? And if we're cutting social media out, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are spending a couple hours a day answering comments and liking different things. So it's all about priorities. Yeah. And when you're on social media, even when you're not on it, you're on it. You know what I mean? You're walking around thinking about what someone just said on the comment. You're walking around thinking you got to reply to that thing. You're walking around thinking about whatever story they just shared. Or what you're going to post next, or we could go on and on. Right. And you're missing out on higher level ideas, free level ideas. You in a free space is worth more than having every person in the world follow you on Facebook. You in the highest space of you is more valuable. It changes the dimensions of the planet. You come up with higher level ideas. You have a space that's much more invincible. You're not affected by things on this physical plane. You're in a higher dimension. One thing that's amazing is to unhook yourself from the addiction to the physical dimension. Do you consider yourself a minimalist? No. Okay. Are you somebody that has a lot of possessions and a lot of mementos and sentimental things? No, I just don't have a label. I I have a decent sized house, but it's not a big house and it's not a small house. And it can change if I just realize it's what I I don't need. And when I say need, I mean like what expands my soul. I'm definitely not a minimalist, but I do go all the stuff that's in my garage that I don't need. Let's get rid of it. You know, if I have anything in my house that's based on, you know, I should have it or it's something I inherited or it's something I'll use later, then I'm actually denying my soul by keeping it. My soul doesn't want it. Well, you talk about how it actually, the physical things take up space in our mental world and causes tension. So how do we find that balance? How have you found the balance of, you know, getting rid of things and keeping what you need? And it's almost like, I know there's a book called The Magical Art of Tidying Up or something like that, the Marie Kondo book. Yes. That's weirdly there. I'd been feeling this before I ever even knew about the book, but I just found for me that I really asked myself, do I want this thing in the moment? right? Like, do I need this thing? Would I love this thing? Or is it something I'm keeping for later? And if it's something I can feel my body doesn't want, but I have a mental excuse, then I'm in the practice of getting in my head. So my best example came a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, when I was cleaning the closet, and I found a poster. The poster was of my old Comedy Central special. And I was thinking, should I keep this? And there was a part of me debating on keeping it. And I thought, well, if I ever have a kid, which I have now, but I thought then if I ever have a kid, I can show them this. 
well, that wasn't my body saying yes. That's like a reason. Do you see the difference? Like my body just says yes to some things and then it needs a reason for other things. Why is that? Right. So if I need a reason, that would only show up because I'm no. <laughs> like I don't want it. I don't care about this poster. I don't care about that thing that I did 10 years ago. So I walked over to a dumpster and I threw it out and it shattered too. And I remember walking away and my body just easing up and going, if I have a kid, they'd rather have me as a present father more than look at this accomplishment I made 12 years ago. You know, I, that's not who I am. I'm this moment. Something you talk about in your book is that we really never own anything. We're just borrowing it and we're either going to leave or whatever it is is going to leave. So I think having that perspective in the back of your mind can just relieve a lot of tension. Yeah, because tension is your mind holding on to an old story. Tension is here you are in this moment, but we have so much stuff and so many things that we think we need to do. And we're so attached to each other and we're so attached to social media. Isn't it weird? Like we're attached to what the president does. Isn't that just bizarre? Like think of nature all obsessing over one tree, <laughs> like all of nature having an impeachment trial for a tree. Are all the stars worshiping 2% of the stars and there's like a TMZ star that follows them around and we move so bizarrely and we're so attached to each other and circumstances and all the stuff. And we aren't actually looking at what we're losing by being so attached to each other. Even just the idea of the relationship. Look, if you're going to be attached to a relationship, it might not be a good relationship because you're keeping your old story alive. You want something that expands you and changes you and takes you higher and a good everything like that. You want a good career like that. You're different. You know, I've had it in the past where I had relationships where I go, they go how's your relationship going? Go, oh, we're good. We haven't fought in three months. That's not good. <laughs> That's not a good measurement. You know what I mean? And we have jobs like that. Oh, it's good. You know, yeah, there haven't been any problems. Okay. My career changes me every week. I just did a meditation retreat last week and fell apart and cried on the stage as I released a level of attachment to the audience I didn't even know was there. It was crazy. And I transcended things in front of the audience. This career changes me. Like I'm motivated by the advice that's coming through me right now. I'm going to do different things because of this interview. So how different would life be if I have this career that changes me? It's my highest me. And that's what I think we want for everything. Does it expand my soul? You know, focusing on a sports team doesn't do that for me, right? Focusing on what drama is going on on the news or whatever doesn't do that for me. So letting go of other people's things is a real freeing thing. Yeah. And it kind of ties back to what we we're just talking about not really owning anything because we're only here for a certain period of time and realizing that life is finite and, you know, we're only here for a short period of time can be so motivating. Yeah. Um, my friend Glenn Morshauer has a quote that he says, it's because this moment is temporary that it's so incredible. And it's because of this moment. I don't have another moment like this moment coming up. And one huge mistake we make is we move as if our time is infinite and our money isn't. So we make decisions out of a hoarding of the money or a fear of how expensive it would be in sacrifice of our soul. And our change is when we move as if our time is limited because it is and our money isn't. Money is infinite. They keep printing it. It's all over the place. How do you stay in the present moment? Is it come back to the whole taking time every day to sit in silence? Or how do you go about applying that to day to day life? Yeah, I think one way is by understanding and bringing in a revelation in your body that you are the moment. In other words, if we're trying to get into the moment, that's the ego trying to connect to the essence of what you are. But if we really break down the ego, there's no way you could be your beliefs because your beliefs change and you're still here. If you believed one thing fully and then you believe another opposing thing and you existed through both of them, doesn't that mean you couldn't be your beliefs? Doesn't that mean you have to be something beyond that? And you can't be your body because it changes. Your body can be chubby or, or buff or, or skinny. You can have a five-year-old's body, then an adult's body. So you can't be your body. There's parts of our body that are dying all the time right now, our hair follicles and cells and everything, all dying all day. So to me, you have to be much more this moment. That's the infinite permanent space of what you are. And most people think I am my uh, amount of money. I am a mother. Those are clothes we might wear, but that's not what you are. And to connect to the essence of what you are is the most empowering thing there is, to make your mind aware of what you are, to connect to that place. I love that, Kyle.
This has just been such a great conversation. But one final question for you. What does ultimate health mean to you? Oh, all aspects of yourself, every aspect of yourself, you know, we usually think it's based on physical and eating. And of course, those are there. But I know a lot of people that have eaten really healthy and still are getting sick. I really believe that's because it's time to release and change patterns in a way that can release old attachments. To me, ultimate health is releasing yourself from your attachments. To me, ultimate health is expansion, your expansion. That is a real thing. The connection to your soul will just cause the removal of the clutter that's in the way of you having ultimate health. You are here to connect to that space. Beautiful. And coming full circle back to the diet thing, I know you ended up going back to the raw vegan diet a second time and it didn't work out as well for you. So tell us about that and what your current diet looks like. Well, the factor of what made the raw vegan diet work the first time might have been partly that I was eating raw vegan, but it also was the fact that I was changing a pattern, right? That I had been someone who ate with my parents and associate like a lot of us do that food equals love and connection. Well, in shifting this diet this way, I suddenly had to find my own connection, my own self, my own power, and remove out and cry out those old stories. And then years later, I was like, I want to go raw vegan again and go another 90 days because I thought that was the way. And it didn't do the same thing. Why? Because I already have learned that lesson. And when I was in third grade, you learn the third grade tactics so you can move to fourth grade. But you don't then go, okay, now I'm in fifth grade. So I'm going to use third grade tactics to go to sixth grade. Do you get what I'm saying? Life goes, now it's time for you to learn something new. So I'm going to do things totally different than you've ever seen. I know you don't understand what I'm doing, but I'm going to screw stuff up for you. So you have to learn life in a new way. And that's what life does. And what are you eating these days? I definitely like to usually, but not always intermittent fast. I'm at a very kind of cool, just chill place. I eat mainly vegan, but not fully. I'll have eggs a little bit here and there. And I don't eat bread or very much sugar. I don't know. I kind of like to have little windows at the moment of like two to five of eating like just some good vegetarian stuff, healthy. I try to keep it organic. I'm not into eating poison that much. But I also believe more my pain would be be resistance to poison than poison. (laughs) But yeah, you know, I have no rules at the moment. I'm just kind of chilling. And the beautiful thing is a year from now, it might be totally different and you're going to listen to your body, I'm sure. Yes, it's all about listening to your body, your heart and your soul and following what it's trying to show you will cause growth and make the world better and heal you and heal others weirdly in magical ways you can't see from here. Beautiful. And Kyle, how can the listeners connect with you after the show? There's kylecease.com. There's evolvingoutloud.com. I have probably 500 videos on YouTube great interviews on there and different things, but they can write info at kylecease.com. We have several meditation retreats coming up and I'll tell you, it's the most transformational experience. You'll, it's, it makes ayahuasca walk in the park, as someone said this last week, because we meditate and then we see patterns and then we release them. So there's a lot of tears and change and then a new life on the other side of it. Oh, and there's also another thing we have is called the Absolutely Everything Pass, which is like my Netflix of all my content. But it also is me doing a weekly live call where I answer questions every Wednesday night. It's like stuff that was thousands of dollars of mine. And it's now just it's 29 a month and you can cancel at any point. But it's so worth it. And it is this best C money investment you can have. And you'll have to know, too, a lot of that money that comes into us goes to charity and other things that are making the world better too. That's amazing. Coming back to hell and sea again. Yeah, full circle right there. All right, Kyle, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. And I'm going to link everything up over at ultimahealthpodcast.com for the listeners and just wishing you all the best. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Kyle. Lots of great points discussed and lots of great takeaways. And we'd love to see what you took away from today's show over on Instagram. Be sure to take a screenshot of listening to the show, whichever platform you're listening on, share it with us by tagging Ultimate Health Podcast and tagging Evolving Out Loud. Let us know what you think. And also what you can do is share this episode with a friend. Tell someone in your life to subscribe to the show, listen to your favorite episode or any episode and get the Ultimate Health message out there. This is the best way to grow our show and to reach new people. Thank you for helping spread the good word and looking forward to seeing what you share over on Instagram. 
For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash 328. We have links there to everything we discussed in a show summary, so be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, you do so much for the show and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he's been reading a cool psychological book called Snakes and Suits. And it's about how sociopaths work their way into high positions in big corporations and get away with terrible behavior. And he's finding it really interesting. Jace, I got to say, this isn't my type of read, but uh, glad you're enjoying it. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.